And when I look at the overall viewpoint and psychological standing of the Muslim Ummah towards the world today, it's very negative. This attitude of doom and gloom that you see the Ummah having today where everything is against us, everyone is against us, everything is bad. I, I've never seen this from our Prophet no matter how many people oppressed him, no matter the names that they called him, no matter the slanders they put out about him, no matter how many armies gathered against him. So where do we get this doom and gloom scenario from? How is it that a Muslim could live their lives in any other parameter other than to say, I am blessed, Alhamdulillah. You put me in a palace, I'm blessed. You put me in a dark prison, I'm blessed. You take away everything I have, I'm blessed. My life, I'm still blessed. This is the attitude of the, the mu'mineen is that they are blessed everywhere that they go. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to have tawakkul. That is trust without understanding. Tawakkul is that you rely upon Allah even though it doesn't seem to make sense. That even though it looks like the plan is going completely the opposite way than it was supposed to, you trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said that the affair of the believer is strange. It's ajeeb, it's amazing that no matter what comes to them is khair for them. If Allah grants them some good, they are thankful to Allah for it and Allah blesses them for it. And if Allah afflicts them with some fitan, some trial, some tribulation, then they are patient with Allah and Allah rewards them for their patience. So there is no source of bad for the true believer. It's all good. Even the bad, even the hardship, even the difficulties, even the struggles are a benefit to those who believe. Because it either erases the sins that they've earned in this life, thus freeing them from answering before Allah about it, or Allah is elevating their ranks in Jannah. Either one of those are fine with me. So let whatever hardship comes, no problem. Allah tests those whom He loves. So if Allah stops testing this ummah, then this ummah should be worried. And then when the Prophet ﷺ handed that torch to this ummah, what did he do? He raised his fingers towards the heavens and he said, Oh Allah, bear witness. Oh Allah, bear witness. I have indeed conveyed your message. He was telling Allah Azza wa Jal that you gave me a job to do. Qum fa'anzir. Get up and go warn them. U'du'u illa sabir rabbika bil hikmah. You gave me that job and I've done it. And now I have passed that torch and that responsibility on to the greatest ummah. Therefore, I have indeed conveyed the completeness of your message. And how did Allah respond? So beautiful. Al-yawm akmaltu lakum deenukum. This day, I have perfected for you your religion. I have made my deen kamal for you. Upon the backs of this ummah, Allah decided to perfect His way of life for mankind. Since the beginning of time, Allah had been sending revelation after revelation, messenger after messenger, slowly evolving this systematic way of life called Islam. It was always based upon the same principle of Tawheed, but the system was always evolving for the change of mankind. But then Allah decided upon the backs of the Ummah of Muhammad والسلام, I will declare my way of life for mankind perfected. And I have chosen for you, Islam is your deen, and conferred my ni'am upon you. That's who we are. That's the legacy that we carry with us every single day. How you can understand that and comprehend that and still have a doom and gloom outlook and vision of the world is beyond my comprehension. No matter what they do, no matter what we go through, no matter what plot shaitan puts in front of us, we always will be the umm of Muhammad والسلام, We will always be here to help humanity. We will always be here to serve the good for humanity. We will always be here to stand up for justice, to stand up against injustice, to spread the glad tidings of Jannah and paradise for those who believe. We will always be here for that reason, no matter what happens. Because that's the way our Prophet ﷺ did things. He did not let how people treated him affect his vision of the world. 
He did not let the names that he was called and the abuses that he suffered change his vision that he wanted to save humanity from its own detriment. That's who we are. And we should never change that because of how we are treated. Because doing so would be a dishonor to the very message that we say we are here to represent. We are here to help the world. We are here to help eradicate injustice, no matter wherever it finds its place. We are here to help the homeless. We are here to help the poor, the destitute. We are here to help the oppressed. We are here to help those suffering from alcoholism, drug addiction, any type of abuse, whether it be spousal abuse or drug abuse or whatever it is, we are here to help. That's the message that this ummah should have. That's the message that this ummah should have and it's the mission that this ummah should be presenting through its actions, not just its speech. Protests, I cannot find one place in recorded history where protests have accomplished a whole lot. Petitions don't usually do a whole lot. But what can change things is for you to honor your word to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To be true and sincere to your covenant with Allah Azza wa Jal to worship Him and obey Him and to serve humanity. Because then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself confers favor on you. And whomever Allah confers favor on, they find victory. And they find solace in the hearts of even their enemies. Stop seeking your honor from people who don't even possess it to give it to you in the first place. If you want people to like you, that's fine and dandy. You'll waste your life doing that. You'll waste your life trying to get people to like you. I don't care if anyone likes me. I'm not bothered if you like me or not. What I want is I want izzah. I want honor that comes from Allah. Because when Allah honors you, He raises you. And that honor belongs to Allah. Allah is dhul izzah. He's the owner of honor. And He's also... The owner of the heart of every human being he has created. And he may flip that heart in whichever way that he wishes. This is why the Prophet والسلام, used to often make the dua, Ya muqallib al qulub, thabit qalbi ala dinik. O oh, you who owns the heart, steady my heart upon your religion. Allah turns hearts. You're not going to turn anyone's heart. You barely possess the capability to control your own heart. You ask Allah for the steadfastness of this. This is something that the Prophet ﷺ used to ask for. Steadfastness of heart. So how do you think that you who can't control your own heart barely will control the hearts of others? No. We need to seek after the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah will honor us through the people. Forget about everything else. Don't even pay it any attention. Our viewpoint of the world needs to be as this. So what do we do? We understand that Allah has a plan. Allah is perfect. Therefore, Allah's plan for this ummah is perfect. And if you think Allah doesn't have a plan for this ummah, then your iman is substantially weak and flawed. Allah has a plan for this ummah. We are just trying too hard to do our own thing, not realizing and trusting in Allah's plan. At the time of Musa alayhi salam, Fir'aun had put out an announcement to all the, the firstborn children of Bani Israel because he was afraid, because he had a dream that one of them was going to overthrow him. Ta, correct? So Musa's mother was visited by an angel and told her to place your child in a box, put him in the river, the Nile River, a very big river, and trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect him. Yes or no? Is this not how the story went? So that was Allah's plan. So Musa's mother with Iman placed him in the box and put him in the river. But she also sent her daughter to go check where he went. You see, this is a mother's love. <laughs> Even though she trusted Allah's plan, go watch where he goes. So as the box floats along, where does it end up? It lands in Fir'aun's backyard. <laughs> That's it, it's over. This plan didn't work. And can you imagine Musa's sister and, and mother thinking, Oh my God, we, we, sent him on, we sent him away to take him away from Fir'aun. And now he's landed in Fir'aun's backyard. This plan doesn't look like it's working. But then Fir'aun's wife, who had 
hidden iman in her heart came and showed favor with Fir'aun to get him to take this child in. And when they tried to look for a suckling mother, a, a mother to breastfeed this child, he wouldn't take from anyone. Until Musa's sister stepped forward and said, look, I know someone whom I guarantee you I'll bring her and she'll take. They said, fine, go get her. So he went and got Musa's mother, brought him. Right away, the baby started to eat. After that, Musa and his mother were both protected under royal guard to make sure that nothing happened to either one of them. You see, this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan works. You see, we, we, we were given these little brains that are very limited, very, very limited. Trying to understand Allah's plan with this is not going to work. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to have tawakkul. You trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So she trusted in Allah. And Allah made sure that Musa was protected in Fir'aun's house to grow up and become a minister in his kingdom to eventually overthrow him from the inside and free Bani Israel. You see, Allah's plan is peculiar to us human beings sometimes. But Allah's plan is perfect. Perfect. At any time, Musa's mother could have ran off and said, look, we're not staying in this house. You know what I mean? This is not working. He's going to find out who this is. But no, Musa's mother had tawakkul upon Allah. She had complete reliance on Allah Azza wa Jal. There was a story that Ibn Rajab, rahimahullah, writes about a man named Abu Bakr al-Ansari. He was known as Qadi al-Maristan as well, from our Salaf. He was a very pious man known for his taqwa who lived in the city of Mecca. One day he said that he was out searching for food in the city of Mecca. He was hungry. And he came across a bag on the ground and picked it up. Inside of it was a very expensive pearl necklace. And he tied it up and took it back to his home. It didn't belong to him, so he went back out searching for food. Later on, a man was walking around the streets of Mecca saying, I lost a pearl necklace, has anyone found it? So Abu Bakr went to him and said, look, I found a pearl necklace, describe the one you lost, and I'll tell you if it's the one I have. It was the one. And the man was offering a big reward for whoever found it. So Abu Bakr went and gave it to the man, and the man tried to pay him his reward, and he wouldn't take it. He didn't feel right taking money for giving someone back something that belonged to him. Later on, Abu Bakr said he could not find sustenance in Mecca or reliable work, so he got on a ship. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says his world is very big. If you can't make it one place, make hijrah. So he was leaving and he got on a ship and a storm came and broke the ship. And many people died, but Abu Bakr said he was able to hold on to a piece of wood from the ship that blew him to an island. When he got to this island, he couldn't find anyone, so he sat down in the masjid and started to recite Qur'an. He was known as having very beautiful recitation of the Qur'an. The people of that island heard someone reciting and they went in and they asked him if he would stay with them and they would pay him and house him and feed him to teach them and their children to recite Qur'an. So he found a job there. Later on, they learned he knew how to read and write, so they increased his salary to teach them how to read and write. After a while, he decided that he didn't want to be there because that's not where he wanted to go in the first place. He wanted to go somewhere else or maybe even back to Mecca. And the people there realized he was about to leave. And they said, no, we can't let him leave. We have to keep him here. How are we going to keep him here? Well, let's get him married. <laughs> let's get him married. He ain't going nowhere. So they brought a proposition to him that there was a girl who had just been orphaned of the most honorable family of the most beautiful women of that place. He gave in. And the nikah was performed and the girl was brought to him. And he said as he looked up at her, he got to her neck and he dropped his head and started to weep. The girl thought that because she was ugly, that's why he was crying, so she was heartbroken. And the people were embarrassed, you know, that oh, what have you done? And he said, no, no, it's not because of her beauty or not. But on her neck is a necklace that I recognized. I found that same necklace in the streets of Mecca one day and returned it to an old man. And they started saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. That necklace belonged to her father and he gave it to her before he passed away. And we used to hear him talking about a man that he met in Mecca one day when he lost this, ne lost this necklace. And he said he was the most pious man that he had ever laid eyes upon. And we used to hear him openly making dua to Allah in this masjid for you to one day be married to his daughter. You see, Allah's plan sometimes doesn't make any sense. Abu Bakr didn't realize that the reason he couldn't find sustenance in Mecca, the reason why he got on that ship, the reason why the storm happened, the reason why he was floated to that island was all because Allah had decided 
to answer the dua of that father. And he had no choice. You see, Allah's plan is perfect. You see, Abu Bakr had a plan. And Allah had a plan. And Allah is the best of those who plan. And Allah's plan is always going to overtake anyway. We fight it too hard sometimes. We try to fight with the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we can't, if we can't envision it right in front of us, then it's not reality. Sometimes we just have to tawakkul. It means let go. Just let go. Let go and let Allah take care of it. That's the way we have to deal with things sometimes. The hands-off approach. That if, if there's nothing you can do about it, let go and let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deal with it. That's tawakkul. Allah has a plan. At the time of Dawood alayhi salam, there was a woman who approached him in his court and asked him a question very angrily. Is Allah just or is Allah unjust? It's a very peculiar question. So he asked the woman, what causes you to ask such a question? And she said that I knit things and I take them to the market and sell them. And with the money that I make, I buy food for myself and my children and I buy more material for the next day and nothing's left over. And this is how I survive every single day, barely getting by. She said, today on my way to the market, a bird came and swooped and took my knitting and flew away. And now I have nothing to sell at the market today and will not be able to feed my children. Is Allah just or is Allah unjust? It's a very difficult question to answer. As she was discussing this, some men came in with big bags of gold and they dropped them in front of Dawood salam. And they said, this is sadaqah for Allah to whomever you desire and see fit that it goes to. And they were, not, they were strangers to that place. So Dawood asked them, what is the story behind this? They said, we are merchants who travel by sea. And we were on our way here and a big storm came and broke our sail. And we were not able to steer the ship, so it was just wandering aimlessly, and we thought that we were going to end up dying. And we made dua to Allah, that if Allah would free us from this predicament, that we would give away all of our earnings on this boat in His sake. They said, not long after we made this dua, a bird flew by and dropped some knitting material that we were able to use to repair our sail, thus making it to your land. And so here we are fulfilling our oath to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Dawood looks at the woman and he asks her the same question that she asked him. Is Allah just or is Allah unjust to his slaves? You have a Lord who is working for you on land, at sea, and in the air. Now is Allah just or is he unjust? And he gave her all of the gold. You see, sometimes Allah's plan does not make sense. Sometimes it feels like we're at the bottom of the barrel. That maybe your personal life is in shambles right now. Maybe you have family problems. Maybe you have all kinds of financial issues. It looks like the um is scraping the bottom of the barrel right now. Everybody hates us. They're banning us everywhere. They're... So this plan doesn't seem to be making any sense. It doesn't seem like anything is working right now. But I know with no doubt, with no reservation, no hesitation, with a smile on my face every day that Allah's plan is perfect. It might not make sense to you or I. I might not even live long enough to see it. But I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a perfect plan for this ummah. Our job is to simply do what he asked us to do. To have faith in him. To worship him alone. To obey him. To help humanity see the light of tawheed. To help the, whole, the, the poor, the needy, the destitute. Those who can't help themselves. We as Muslims in the West have nothing to complain about. We are blessed beyond reason. We, we have so much luxury. Go from our heated homes to our heated cars to our heated offices. We have everything that we could need to survive in this life. Even more, we, we, we live a life of exuberance in, in, in the West. And yet we complain. We complain. There are people who are suffering like that and they don't complain. They don't complain. I met a woman one time in Mandera, Kenya, when we were going to build a well there. And we asked her, how are you going to feel when this well is built? Are you going to be happy? She said, no. I said, what? She said, because I'm afraid if life becomes too easy for us, we'll forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If things become too easy for us, we'll forget Allah. This was a very old lady. The wisdom. You listen to the elders. Trust me. Old people have a lot to teach you. She said, if, 
things become too easy, these young ones that didn't screw up, like I grew up struggling for everything, will forget to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's deep. Those of us who are going to die alone in our beds, we're the ones that should be worried about our own affairs. This ummah, the ummah of the West, you don't have to believe me, but the ummah of the West will be questioned heavily on the day of judgment. Heavily. Because we carried the banner of Tawheed in a land that was lost. And we spent decades upon decades, if not generations, doing nothing about it and nothing with it. My grandfather used to tell me, he used to always tell me that a man is known by his deeds, not by his words. This needs to be what this ummah is about. We need to become about our deeds, our actions. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.